بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمین و صلی الله علی سیدنا و نبینا ابلقاسم المصطفى محمد و علی آله طیبین الطاهرین لا سیما بقیت الله فی الاردین اجل الله تعالی فرجه الشریف و جعلنا من اعوانه و انصاره In the name of Allah the compassionate the merciful Thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we are going to start our series of lectures on Islamic philosophy. The text which has been chosen for this series of lectures is Philosophical Instruction, which is the English translation of Amuzesh Falsafe by Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi. As you know, teaching philosophy has a long history in Islamic seminaries, especially in countries such as Iran and Iraq, in which Shia seminaries are active and flourished for many centuries. There have been different textbooks and sometimes different books which were not originally written as textbooks but adopted as textbooks used by masters of philosophy and teachers of philosophy. In the last few decades among the most important textbooks on in Islamic philosophy one can mention two important works by Allama Taba Taba'i, the author of Al-Mizan, Fi Tafsir Al-Qur'an. He wrote two books, one as an introduction to Islamic philosophy and the other for advanced studies in Islamic philosophy. The first one is called Bedayatul Hikmah which literally means beginning of wisdom or beginning of philosophy. And the other one is called Nihayatul Hikmah, which means end of philosophy. Meaning that the first is an introductory book and the second is the one is for, which is for the advanced learners of philosophy. These two books were very well received because they w came into existence in the age in which there was uh, no really textbook in philosophy. For example, people used to uh, study books by Ibn Sina, like Asharat, Al Asharat wa Tanbihat, which was commented by Khaja Nasir al Din Tusi, and also Al Aswar by Sadruddin Shirazi. And later, the great work by Hakim Sabzawari, which was f originally as a series of poems and then commented by himself, uh, usually known as Manzume. So these were the popular textbooks, and some of them still are used as textbooks, but none of them were originally uh, meant by their authors to be used as textbooks. They were books written to introduce uh, their final findings in the field of philosophy. But Allama Taba Taba'i, when he saw the need for some books in which the features and requirements of textbooks are considered, he wrote the book Bedayatul Hikmah and Nihayatul Hikmah. But uh, still, there was a need for some uh, more uh, comprehensive and at the same time more organized work on philosophy. So this is why Ayatollah Mesbah Yazdi, who is 
uh, one of the most important students of Allama Taba Tabai in the field of philosophy and tafsir, he uh, started to uh, teach and write a series of philosophy in a very systematic and organized manner. And finally, this book, Amuzesh Falsafe, or Philosophical Instructions, came into existence and it was well received in Islamic seminaries and also universities in which Islamic philosophy is taught. The book has some merits. I'm going to quickly mention some of these merits which are mentioned also in the introduction to the book so that when we are going to inshallah refer to this book as our main textbook and our main source for this series of lectures you would know why we have chosen this text first of all uh, the book uh, starts with uh, some introductory lessons on philosophy as a concept and also as a historical phenomenon because we must know how philosophy came into existence and what were the stages in which philosophy developed or flourished or sometimes declined. We should know who were the main figures in Western philosophy and also in Islamic philosophy and Eastern philosophy in general. And also uh, we should know that how the philosophical works came into existence after the advent of Islam, after the beginning of the message of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how Muslim philosophers uh, adapted Greek philosophy to Islamic teachings and had their own contributions so that something as Islamic philosophy came into existence. So these are some things which are very important. Of course they are s partly related to the history of philosophy, but for a person who wants to know something about philosophy itself, it's important to know uh, part of the history as well. Of course we will be very brief in this regard. And the other thing which is also very important in this book is that it uh, starts, the serious part of the book uh, starts with epistemology. In most of our uh, texts uh, on Islamic philosophy, uh, the authors immediately uh, start with metaphysics, with discussions about existence. But there has been a mm, real attention made by Allama Tabatabai and by Ayatollah Misbah Yazdi and by Ayatollah Shahid Mutahari to the issue of epistemology or theory of knowledge or what we call it Elmul Ma'rifa in Arabic or in Farsi we call it Ma'rifa Chanasi. This is very important part of philosophy and it seems that we should uh, start first of all with this part of philosophy before entering into the discussions about being or existence. Because first of all we should know how we come to know something and is it possible to know something and after securing the possibility of coming to know something, being certain about facts, then we can start our discussions about existence or being as such. So this is very important. So inshallah, as you will see, there will be 10 lessons on epistemology and you will see that how Ayatollah Mesba thinks we can come to know moral concepts, uh, uh, sorry, philosophical concepts, as well as philosophical propositions. The other merit of this book is that it has uh, clear references and attentions towards 
Western philosophy. So new problems in the field of philosophy, new questions, modern challenges are addressed in this book. Of course, as far as the uh, space permits. This is also very important. So you are not uh, studying philosophy in an isolated world. You are not uh, studying philosophy in a backward way. No, you are studying philosophy in the way that one must know philosophy in our own age. And this is also important. The other thing which is considered in this work is that the ideas are put in a very logical and systematic manner. First of all, if there are some concepts in some moral pro uh, some philosophical uh, problems, the concepts are clearly defined by the author. Because unfortunately, many confusions have appeared in philosophy and also other disciplines because of lack of common understanding between two parties. So s this party is proving something and the other party is disproving something else because they don't have a common concept, a common understanding in between. So first of all, we should always try to clarify concepts. This is what is called conceptual clarification. So usually each lesson uh, starts with clarification of the concepts involved in that philosophical problem. And also, a step by a step, one can follow up the arguments. So for example, if you want to argue for the fundamentality of existence, you will see that what are the concepts involved? What are the uh, steps that the author has taken to come to the required conclusion. So this is also very important to be organized, to be logical, to be systematic in your discussions. The other uh, merit of this uh, book is that usually after uh, each topic the benefit or the importance or the significance of that issue is mentioned. Because some people may uh, study some moral or philosophical or legal or any sort of issue without knowing exactly what's the benefit beyond studying these issues as a whole, in general, or specifically regarding to that issue. A wise teacher and also a wise instructor is the one who always tries to make it first of all clear for his students, his pupils, why they should learn this, why they should know this. If they know that, it will help them to be uh, determined, to be uh, very uh, eager and very willing to learn. So this is also something which is done in this book. Of course, there are some other merits, especially in the Farsi edition. There are questions after each lesson. There are summaries after each lesson. But uh, these two things are not uh, existent in the English version. So we hope by uh, studying this book as our textbook, uh, we can come to a very profound and clear and systematic understanding of contemporary Islamic philosophy. Of course, this would not be the end. This, this would not be uh, something that you could say that after studying this, I have become a master of Islamic philosophy. As we know, we should always continue learning. We should always keep uh, studying especially issues such as philosophy need much more patience than other disciplines. And we should always be hesitant to make quick decisions, to make quick judgments. 
otherwise uh, we may suffer from misunderstandings, from confusions. This is why masters of philosophy uh, in the past always had this recommendation not to teach philosophy to people who are not morally and also uh, mentally capable to receive lessons in philosophy. Anyway, we hope that inshallah with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we would be able to um, continue with our study of philosophy and inshallah other branches of Islamic sciences. Okay, now after this introduction let's go to the first lesson of the book and that is regarding a very brief and short uh, a study of the history of philosophy. Of course, in the first lesson we are mostly concerned with the beginning of philosophy, how philosophy came into existence and how it developed in its early stages. As you know, human beings have been always concerned with questions about themselves, about the world in which they live, about the way they have come into existence. These are very profound questions, very fundamental and un very underlying questions which have occupied minds of billions of people throughout the history. I think you cannot find any age any era in which there has been no philosophical thought. As far as we know, as far as the literature and written culture show, there have always been philosophical thoughts, philosophical works. Maybe simple, maybe trivial, but uh, still there were something something related to philosophy. Something that now we can term it as philosophy. Maybe they didn't term it as philosophy. Even the author believes, and many people, and I think it's quite understandable, that even before the written history has started, for which we have no written record, but we can understand it by considering paintings and also the religious ideas that the people had at that time. Even at that time also philosophy existed. As soon as man came into this world, philosophical thought must have come to this world because there are questions that leave no man comfortable and convenient without finding answers, proper answers for them. So, the history of philosophy goes back beyond the written history, goes back to the early uh, stages of the creation of man. But, if you are talking about a systematic science, a discipline as philosophy. So most of writers and most of the people who work on the history of philosophy, they take you back to five, six centuries before Christ. Most of the Western writers, they say that history of philosophy started in ancient Greece and Greek philosophers were the first people who started to have systematic way of thinking about the world. Of course there are also other people who say that parallel to the Greek philosophers or even earlier there were Eastern philosophers, Eastern sages who had philosophical teachings. 
and this is the idea which is getting more and more popularity today because you cannot find any religion without having some philosophical idea and you know that the history of religions in the East is very old. So, as far as the written history of philosophy is concerned, perhaps the earliest stage is the Greek uh, philosophy and the people who are very important in this regard and who had a role in uh, originating philosophy, of course in a negative sense, were Sufists. These people were not people who were philosophers, but they did something that contributed to the development of philosophy. Why? Because these people who lived before and also contemporary uh, to Socrates, they had some special and strange ideas which led to Socrates and people sympathetic to him to refute those ideas. And by refuting those ideas, philosophy was formed. So this is why I said they had some contribution to the development of philosophy, but in a negative way. The historians say that there were a group of teachers in Athens and other Greek cities who were teaching students how to be eloquent in their speech. They were paid money as their salary and in return they were giving their students instructions on how to be a good speaker, how to be eloquent, how to be convincing in your arguments. And many people who wanted to be lawyers, they needed such training so that they can defend properly their clients. As you know, in many cases, Unfortunately, the judgment in the court is not made because of this party is right and the other party is wrong. The judgment in many cases is made because the lawyer of this party was very capable, very strong, very, for example, well-known, and he could convince the judge that his client is right. Sometimes people who are criminal, but they are very rich, they had the chance to win the case. So these people who were very eloquent, very experienced, in presenting their cases into the court. Finally, they uh, started to think, is there really something as truth? Because we can teach our students and we ourselves can present our cases in the court in every direction that we want. We, when, we can make a criminal winning the case and an innocent person losing the case. So after some time they say, okay, maybe there is nothing as truth. Maybe it's something conventional, maybe it's something up to us. So they started to make doubt about the very existence of reality. There is a beautiful a story mentioned by the author and is well known in the Persian literature that once a man wanted to deceive some people, some children, to make fun, to ridicule them. So 
wrongly, he said to those children that in a house in the next lane, for example, the landlord is distributing and serving sweets. He is giving out some sweets. So the children who were interested in having free sweets went to the same address that he gave them to have some sweets. After a few minutes, the person who gave them wrong instruction himself started to say, maybe there is really a suite because these people went there and they didn't come back. So let's go and check. I shouldn't lose the chance to have those suites. So he himself was deceived by the lie that he told those people. So the author says that the Sufis had the same experience. So after presenting wrong defense, unjustified arguments in the court and winning the case, they started to say to themselves, perhaps there is no reality at all, there is no truth at all. So these people started to say very uh, strange ideas. Some of them were saying that there is no world at all. It's just like a dream. You think that there is something in front of you. You think that, for example, there is a tree or there is a flower or there is a, for example, friend in front of you. But all these is part of your dream. There's nothing at all. And some of them were saying that there is nothing at all, and if there is something, we cannot know it. This is a bigger problem. First of all, they deny that there is something, and secondly, they say, even if there is something, you cannot know it. The way to know facts is blocked, is closed. No way. Of course, in their ordinary life, they were living, in most of the cases, as ordinary people. So when they were hungry, they were taking food. If they were ill, they were taking medicine. They used to go to their home uh, after they had finished their jobs. Living as ordinary people. But just when they were uh, arguing with other people, they were saying these uh, strange ideas. Very, very few of them are known to be uh, practicing their ideas in their real life. For example, it has been said that one of them, which uh, was a master of Sufis, was so um, attached to his own ideas that whenever he was walking on the street, if there was, for example, a well on his way, he used not to attend. He didn't pay any attention. So he may go down and drop and fall down in the well. And the students were always accompanying him to make sure that he doesn't go deep into the well. But this is very uh, strange and this was very exceptional. Most of these people, they didn't have these ideas in their ordinary life. Anyway, in response to the claims made by Sufis, Socrates uh, started to argue for the reality of the world and for the possibility of knowing the world. So Socrates uh, started to give instructions to people, to those who were sympathetic to him or sometimes they were um, in disagreement with him. But in both cases he drew the attention of people towards real philosophy. Indeed the term philosophy was coined 
by Socrates. Before Socrates, as far as we know, that this term was not used as a technical term. Because Sufists were called Sufists by themselves. In Greek, Sufis means sage, means learned, wise. So these people were calling themselves as sage or wise. Socrates said that I am not calling myself a philosopher in an ordinary way. Because n today when we say philosopher, it means a person who is learned, a person who is wise or sage. He said, I call myself a person who has love for wisdom. So I don't call myself Sufist, means le sage or learned. I call myself Philosophos. And for him, Philosophos at the beginning just meant someone who loves wisdom, someone who loves philosophy in our today's sense. So he said, I am a lover of wisdom. This shows his humility. He was very humble. And in many cases, he himself was arguing with his counterparts in a very humble way, in a dialogue form, as Plato reports to us, and always showing his real thirst for the truth and showing that he himself is improving his knowledge. Anyway, it was the time that the philosophy in a very serious manner, in a systematic manner, started to develop and come into existence. After Socrates, one of his great students, Plato, continued his job. Indeed, most of our knowledge about Socrates is limited to what we have received from Plato, because Plato in his dialogues give us a report, a good report about Socrates. Of course, we are not 100% sure that the ideas that he express on behalf of Socrates are really for the Socrates or are Plato's own ideas. In some cases maybe his own ideas. But uh, the most important source for knowing ideas of Socrates is to refer to the works by Plato. And Plato continued the same job of introducing, defining and also defending proper philosophy. And after him his student Aristotle had a very magnificent role in developing philosophy and especially in articulating logic. Of course, you know, logic is something that we all know by our instincts, we all know by our nature, because this is the way that our reason works. But he articulated the laws of logic. Of course, logic is existed before Aristotle, but he was the one who put them together, compiled them, and made lots of uh, mm, articulations. So these three figures are very important in uh, ancient Greek, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And some people believe that indeed nothing new has ever been mentioned in philosophy after these three. And everything which is mentioned in philosophy after these three can be considered as a footnote on the ideas of one of these three. Anyway, after these great three figures, the philosophy flourished in Greek for a while. A student of these people, students of Aristotle, uh, started to compile the work of Aristotle and teach it to other people, 
teach them to other people, circulate them. So philosophy flourished. But when we come to the fourth century, there was a shift, there was a turning point, and we see that at that time the interest in philosophy went into decline in Athens, the capital city of Greece. And the center of learning and teaching philosophy moved into Alexandria. We call it Eskandaria, Alexandria in Egypt. And inshallah, in the next session, we will continue our discussion and we will see how the Western world and Islamic world received and embraced philosophy afterwards. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين